Amen. Second Samuel chapter 6. We're going to begin at verse number 1. And we will read through verse number 8. Second Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And you can see it on the screen overhead. At least so long as I keep my head bowed, you can. <laughs> Amen. Second Samuel chapter 6, the first eight verses, and the word of God today from the King James text reads, And David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him, from Baal to of Judah, to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart, and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah, and Uzzah, and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark, and David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased, because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perusa to this day. Now, I also want to read for you the next four verses as well. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obedidim the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obedidim the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. I meant to change the... Yeah, I did put the full passage up there, but I quoted the 1 through 8. I should have said 1 through 12. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Father, today once again we come into this place, this space which has been set aside and has been sanctified, God, for the use of the kingdom of God and for your purposes it is our hope that from this room, from this space in our home, Lord, that many souls will come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many who have been ostracized, many who have been pushed aside and thrown away by the church because of circumstances in their lives that uh, they have no more control over than the color of their eyes or the shade of their skin. I hope, God, that you'll use this space, this place, this sanctuary, Lord, as 
a place where those souls can find refuge, they can find reconciliation, they can find restoration to their faith. <laughs> Lord, we realize that our sanctuary is simple, but that's fine because our God is not confined by walls of stone, neither is he served by walls of gold or silver or platinum. But Lord, today it is the hearts of men and women that you desire to dwell in. The church is not made up of structure, it is made up of people. It is made up of believers, those who have embraced, believed, and obeyed this wonderful gospel message. The word of God must go forth, and it is always a daunting task. As the minister of the gospel, I am always so greatly aware of how important this office is and how important this function is. And I ask God today that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest upon the messenger of God. Help me to communicate faithfully, to communicate in such a way that the people of God might not just hear the words, but receive the message. And anoint every ear today, God, that would hear those in this place, those watching by reason of the internet, those who will later watch and listen. By reason of the internet, let the anointing reach beyond this room and touch their lives, their hearts as well. Oh God, lift us up today to heavenly places with you. Bring us into closer fellowship and closer communion with you than we have ever before known. For we ask it in Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise amen. God and amen. 2 Samuel chapter 6 shares with us a story. In many regards, it is a happy story. It is a glad story, a good story. But as is so often the case in many good and happy stories, there are those sad elements. David goes to the Ark of the Covenant and to bring it back to the city of David. And in the process of the journey, a man died. Not only did a man die, but he died at the hand of God. He was guilty of doing something that angered the Lord. And the Lord smote him because he was angered. Now, it's kind of funny. If you understand the Ark of the Covenant and you understand its purpose and its function then you would understand why God was angry. And I've got news for you. The Lord was upset long before he smoked Yusa. The Lord was quite upset. You know, have you ever been in a situation where, you know, you go into work or you go into your husband, your wife, your partner, and you're already kind of flustered. Something happened that already had you kind of upset. And then they do something that seems so small and so trivial, and you just seem to snap their head off. You ever done that? I, maybe I'm the only one guilty of ever doing that. But you're already upset. You're already unnerved. And then it doesn't take a whole lot to push you over the edge. This is sort of what happened with the Lord. A lot of people, if you don't understand the details of this story, then you may not understand why God was already pushed to the limit long before Uzzah ever touched the Ark of God. Let me read a little bit of a history of the Ark of the Covenant to you. It, uh, not a lengthy history, just a short history. After Moses died... The children of Israel were led by Joshua into the land of Canaan. When they came to the Jordan River, the waters parted before the Ark of the Covenant. The children of Israel crossed the Jordan and conquered the promised land with the Ark of the Covenant leading the way. Later, the tabernacle was erected at a city called Gilgal. And the Ark of the Covenant was kept there for a season. Later, the Ark was removed and taken to Shiloh, where it remained for nearly 400 years. Israel had become so corrupt 
that they forsook the Lord and worshipped the Queen of Heaven. The Ark of the Covenant fell into the hands of the Philistines, who were forced to return it after many plagues broke out in their land. Later, the Ark of the Covenant was kept at a place called kirath Jerim until David was anointed king of Israel and, and brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem until the temple was erected there. David's son Solomon completed the temple in Jerusalem and placed the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies as God had instructed him to do. There was later a civil war or uh, later there was the civil war and Israel was divided. Ten tribes went to the north and the remaining two stayed in the south. The Ark of the Covenant remained in the temple in Jerusalem. The northern kingdom continually forsook the Lord until God gave them into the hands of the Assyrians and they were deported away in 722 B.C. Later, the remaining two tribes forsook the Lord also, and Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. The Bible does not tell us what then happened to the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark, the, the location today of the Ark of the Covenant is in fact a mystery. We have no idea where the Ark of the Covenant is. Now let me tell you from a biblical perspective, that gave you a little quick overview of the Ark's journey. But here's how the Ark came into being to begin with. In Exodus chapter 25 verses 10 through verse 15, And they shall make an Ark. This is God speaking to uh, Moses. He's giving, them, he's giving him instruction. And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. Within and without shalt thou overlay it and shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be in the one side of it, and two rings in the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, and thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be borne with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. So, God gave Moses very specific instructions as to the measurements of the ark, exactly how long it was to be, how deep it was to be, how high it was to be. There was to be a crown-like feature, which this picture uh, really doesn't portray it quite as well as some I've seen. In other words, it had a rim that came up above the top like a crown, okay, all the way around. And then there were to be two angels facing one another with their wings placed down before them in a... Uh, subservient, you know, or servitude position. And this area was called the mercy seat because the Ark of the Covenant literally represents God's dwelling place where you meet with God personally. This is why the Ark was such an important piece of furniture. They had to make two poles. You see the rings on the side of the Ark? They had to make two poles which were overlaid with gold, wood overlaid with gold that went through the rings and those poles were never to be removed. And those poles, Martin, that is how the ark was to be born. That is how the ark was to be moved. 
How did they move it when David went to retrieve it to bring it into? Let me tell you how they moved it in our primary text today. David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God. And they set the ark of God upon a cart. Mm. They set it on an ox cart. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not how God said the ark was to be moved. That's not how the ark was to be moved. That ark represents the very presence of God. How dare you handle it like a common piece of furniture? Hello now. How dare you not do things God's way? Can you understand why God might have been a little upset before Uzzah ever reached out and touched it? But why was there a problem with Uzzah touching the ark? Well, let's read further in the Word of God. In Deuteronomy 10 and verses 8 and 9, At that time the Lord separated the tribe of Levi. This is when God established the priesthood in Israel of the one out of twelve tribes. The tribe of Levi was separated for the priesthood. So in other words, if you were not of the tribe of Levi, you could not be a priest. If you were of the tribe of Levi, you had no choice but to be a priest. Okay? Listen to why God separated the tribe of Levi in Deuteronomy 10 and 8. At that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Wow. His primary purpose in separating the house of Levi, the tribe of Levi, and making them priests, his primary purpose, number one purpose, was to carry this. This was to be carried only by priests. You couldn't even have common men carry this ark. You couldn't even... There were 12 tribes in Israel, and none of the other 11 tribes could touch that ark. It had to be carried by priests. Well, why would it have to be carried by priests? Because this represents... God's sitting place. This represents God's throne. This is the mercy seat. This is where when it was placed eventually in the Holy of Holies in the temple, this is where the high priest of Israel every year would go behind the veil in order to offer God a sacrifice on behalf of the nation of Israel. And if the Lord did not receive that offering, guess what happened? They'd have to pull the high priest out with a rope. He'd be dead. He'd go behind that curtain, behind that thick veil, and he would offer the Lord the sacrifice before the mercy seat, before the Ark of the Covenant. And they tied bells to his clothing. So that while he was back there, as long as he was moving, jingle, 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 you'd hear those little bells ringing. But if you heard kafwomp and no more bells, then you knew the high priest was dead. And they literally tied a rope around his waist before he went in. So that if the, the offering was not received, they could pull him back out. Can you imagine that? This piece of furniture was far more important than merely a piece of furniture. God literally gave Moses instructions as to exactly how this was to be put together, how it was to be constructed. He also gave Moses instruction as to exactly how that piece of furniture was to be transported and how it was to be moved. And the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister to him, and to bless his name to this day. Wherefore, Levi hath no part nor inheritance with his brethren, 
The Lord is his inheritance, according as the Lord thy God promised him. What does that mean? That means the house of Levi did not work a job except the ministry. You see, this was God's plan from the beginning. When I get up here and tell you that God has ordained, now this isn't my words, this is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul said, God hath ordained that they which preach the gospel are to live of the gospel. They're to be supported by those they minister to. That is exactly how God established it from the very beginning. The house of Levi was one out of 12 tribes, right? They were to be the priests. They were to minister. They were to bear the ark. They were to minister to the Lord before the Lord. And they were not to work any type of secular employment. They were not to do any kind of secular work. The other 11 tribes tithed. And that tithe supported the 12th tribe. Are you following what I'm saying? That is how their priests and their rabbis and their teachers were supported, was through the tithes of the members or the other 11 tribes, okay? So, we understand why God would be upset because, number one, they put the ark on an ox cart. Oh, but David was so kind because he made it a new ox cart. How many times do we think we're doing God a favor when we do things differently than the Lord says to do them? Oh, but we do them nicely. Oh, but Lord, you know, I didn't do it the way you told me to do it, but I still did it very nicely. I, I still did a good job. Lord, I didn't do what you told me to do, but what I did do, I, I did it, you know, the best way I knew how. Hello now. No, the Lord was not pleased because they, they put the ark on an ox cart rather than having it borne by the priests as it was supposed to be borne. Rather than it being shown the proper reverence. Rather than it being... See, it's not the ark, it's not the furniture that deserves the reverence, but the fact that God attached his very own presence to that ark. They were not showing the presence of the God very much reverence. They were not showing it very great respect. Got news for you today. A lot of people come to church and they don't show the presence of the Lord very much respect. Amen. I have a problem. I, I've told you before, I'm not one of these preachers that gets up and preaches in t-shirts and, and jeans. No. That is disrespectful of the presence of God. If you're supposed to be a minister of the gospel, if you're supposed to be a person who represents the God of heaven, the God who went to the cross to save your soul, then honey, you should show a little more respect than that. And you ought to reverence and you ought to show respect for the presence of God. Am I telling the truth? Amen. I have a problem with that foolishness. Oh, God's cool. God's cool. Yeah, God is cool. You can dress any way you want to come. Why, you can get up and preach in bare feet and jeans, and God don't care. You can wear cutoffs and a tank top, and God don't care. Is that so? I reverence the presence of the Lord. I revere the presence of God. How dare we disrespect the very presence of God? Do you know what today the Ark of the Covenant is? Do you know what has become the Ark of the Covenant in the New Testament? We no longer have a piece of furniture that represents the very presence and power of God. No, you and I today are the Ark. You and I have become the ark. God has invested his presence and his power in our lives. We have become the very ark of God. Amen. We've become the dwelling place. Now listen, in 1 Chronicles 15 and verse 2, then David said, none ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. For them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him.
forever. What's the topic I'm speaking on today? You can't handle it. Oh, Uzzah. Uzzah was the son of the man. He was one of two sons who rode on the ox cart with the ark. That ark had been in his father's home for a good length of time. When it's been in your possession long enough, you get to the point where you take it for granted. You can go into some Pentecostal churches like Riverside Church of God where the Holy Ghost sometimes would fall like rain and we would shout and dance and run the aisles. And my God, the power of God would be so strong in that place, Lisa. People were being healed. People were being delivered from devils. People were being helped in so many different ways. And you'd see some kid sitting there chewing and gum, just kind of, you know, man, whatever. Why? Well, I grew up in this. I, I see this all the time. Yeah, I've seen this a hundred, hundred times. This ain't no big deal to me. You begin to take for granted. Oh, I'm going to tell you, you begin to take for granted something. This little New England boy coming down to Texas, I didn't take it for granted. I was thrilled every time the Spirit of God had moved like that. I was thrilled out of my mind. I thought I was at heaven's doorway every time the Holy Ghost would fall and we'd have church like that. I was just thrilled out of my mind. Why? Because I didn't grow up with it. I didn't see it every day like that. I never saw God move like that. I remember preaching at a church uh, one time in a meeting, it was the Spanish Pentecostal Church in New York. And I won't go into all the details, you've heard me share it before. But the Holy Ghost fell like he used to at Riverside Church of God. I mean, the Spirit of the Lord fell. People were shouting and dancing, and we were having church. Uh, one lady I had to cast devils out of. People were receiving the Holy Ghost. People were being healed. Things were happening all over the building. And after the service, the pastor of the church came to me and said, I have never in my life been in a church service like that. Never. I have never seen a church service like that. And I looked at him, and I said, Really? And I'm not kidding. I, I was not putting that on. I was serious. I was like, really? I was surprised. I was totally surprised. Really? He said, brother, I have never in my life seen God move like he just moved. He said, that was the most powerful, incredible church service I have ever taken part in. Here I was taking it for granted. I'd seen God do that many times. I'd seen the Lord. Now, I took it for granted, but I didn't disrespect it. I wasn't sitting there, you know, oh, well, God's moving, yippee yay 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 oh, who cares, what do you do? No, 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 no. I was thrilled to death that God was moving that way. But there is a danger in taking things for granted. Uzzah took the Ark of the Covenant and the presence of God and the power of God for granted. When the ox cart that the ark should have never been on to begin with began to shake a little. If you've ever watched oxen, the Bible said the oxen shook it. So that makes me believe that it wasn't a ditch in the road or it wasn't a bump in the road that caused the ox cart to shake. But if you've ever noticed sometime when an animal is pulling something, a horse or a, a cow or anything, they're pulling it every once in a while, maybe uh, flies will get in their face or maybe they're uncomfortable with the bridle or they're uncomfortable with the apparatus that and they'll kind of shake their body a little. You ever seen them do that? Well, that's what I think of when I read this passage. I believe the oxen, at least one of them, decided to kind of shake himself. And when he did, he caused the yoke, you know, to twist about a little bit, which in turn made the cart kind of tilt side to side. And Usa, Wanting to protect the ark and make sure it didn't fall, make sure it didn't, you know, slide off to one side of there. He reached out to steady it. Well, honey, God already wasn't too happy with your pappy. He already wasn't too happy with David. Now you're just pushing things because you're not a priest, son. And even the priests did not touch the ark. They only touched the pole. That's why God smote him dead. 
God was trying to make a point to everybody else standing around. It wasn't about punishing him so much as I need to make a point to these other folks. That my ark is being disrespected. My presence and my power, that which represents my very presence, is being disrespected and taken for granted. And honey, I've got advice for you today. If you don't remember anything else I say in this message, don't ever take nothing for granted. Because I promise you, if you think you can handle the repercussions of taking anything for granted, I promise you, you can't handle it. The minute you start taking things for granted, you will not be able to handle the repercussions. Relationships die every day. Marriages die every day. Because partners begin to take one another for granted. I always am amused that people who come to me and say, Well, you know, my husband left and bless God. He ran off with another woman and I don't understand it because he never said anything. He never did anything that would indicate he was going to do this. Oh, yes, he did. Oh, yes, he did. Chances are you were taking him for granted and you just didn't listen. I'm going to tell you something. A lot of marriages end, and it's not because the spouse hadn't been saying all along what was ticking them off and what was bothering them and what was causing them grief, but because the other party just took for granted that their spouse was going to be faithful and their spouse was going to live right and do right, and they just took it for granted. And so therefore, whenever they shoveled, they figured the other guy just going to have to take Am I tell them the truth now. You've got to be careful about that, folks. Don't take anything for granted because you can't handle it. You can't handle the repercussions. I don't know how many times, for instance, um, spouses will have issues over money. Two of the biggest causes of divorce in our nation and in the world today are money issues and sex issues. Well, one spouse is out there, you know, spending and spending like a lunatic and spending like a lunatic and spending. And uh, I had a cousin who was married to a fellow, and he made good money, you know, made real good money. But my God, she could spend it faster than he could make it. And she would spend on these fancy clothes and always trying to keep up with the Joneses. Always trying to have the best and the biggest and the brightest, you know. And that caused a lot of problems in their marriage. Now, some would say when their marriage failed, when their marriage ended, some would say, well, but, you know, he never said he was going to exit. Honey, he kept saying over and over again, I can't live like this. We can't keep doing this. We can't keep doing this. But you just ignored him and kept doing it anyway. You see, taking things for granted is the surest way of losing it. Taking things for granted is the surest way to guarantee that you will experience the worst possible repercussions. Amen. Uzzah took for granted the power of God. He took for granted the presence of God. He reached out to touch that ark. Uzzah should have been one of the first to speak up and say, No, no, folks, we cannot move this ark on an ox cart. Even a new ox cart. You know, it doesn't matter if you go and buy yourself the biggest, prettiest Lincoln ox cart or the biggest, nicest uh, Cadillac ox cart there is. The truth of the matter is this thing is not meant to be moved on any kind of a cart, in any kind of a wagon, on any kind of a device. It is only to be borne by the hand of the priests. Am I telling the truth? That's what God ordained. How many things has God ordained in the church today that people are just flat out convinced they can ignore and do their own way and God will just have to deal with it? Am I telling the truth? Right. Amen. How many people get it in their head that, well, I can be a Christian. I don't have to go to church. Hello now. You can't handle it. You can't handle it. You're taking for granted the church will be there when you do want it. And guess what, honey? One day it won't be. 
And the day you want to go to church, the day you need the church, the day that you desperately are going to run for the doors of the church, there ain't going to be no church to run to. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you're going to be facing calamity you've never faced before. You're going to be facing repercussions you've never faced before. How many people, Lisa, think they can handle it? I can handle it on my own. I don't need a church. Listen, the church is not about the building. The church is about the people. I don't need the fellowship of a church to live for the Lord. I don't need to have people who can pray for me when I'm going through hard times. I don't need people who can help bear my burden. I can do it on my own. No, you can't handle it. Take my word for it. You, you can't do things differently than God has designed them to be done and think that you can handle it. It don't work that way. Every time Israel tried to do things differently than the way God designed it to be done, it turned into tragedy. Am I telling the truth? Amen. When David tried to move the Ark of the Covenant in a manner that was inconsistent with God's ordained, process it turned into calamity and then David look at this here's the funny part then David had the nerve to be upset with God yeah. mm. I love people who get mad at God who haven't been doing things the way God asked them to do it from the get go I love people who do things in a different way they know better than God. I know, Lord, I don't need to go to church. I don't need that. I don't need this. I don't need that. I don't need to tithe. I don't need to pray. I don't need to read my Bible. I don't need to do all these things. Bless God, I can do just fine on my own. And then when trouble comes, they turn around and say, God, why did you do this to me? Excuse me? Excuse me? What are you talking about? Everything you've been doing, you've been doing your own way. Got news for you, honey. God didn't do nothing. You invited what came upon you. The Lord said, as long as you're with me, I'll be with you. You walk off by yourself, you're on your own. Amen. If you're walking in the plan of God, if you're walking in God's design, then God will bless you every step of the way. As long as you let him lead. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You want to be a child of God? Got news for you. You better let him lead. You're going to try to do it your own way. You're not walking like a son. You're walking like a prodigal son. And the prodigal son didn't live like the father lived. Unless he was living with the father. Prodigal son wound up in a pretty messy place. He wound up living with a bunch of pigs. And here he is fed, feeding the pigs. And he's looking at the slop he's feeding the pigs. And they, boy, I'll tell you what, that don't look so bad. I think I might could eat that. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? you got to be in a pr pretty miserable place when you're looking at pig's food and thinking, hmm. I don't know. I, I, I could handle some of that because I'm hungry. I done spent all the money. I done did everything I wasn't supposed to do. Now I'm broke and I'm destitute and I'm in a bad place. I don't know about you, but honey, this old preacher boy, I've been broke, I've been destitute, I've been in bad places. And it wasn't because God punished me. It was because I went there on my own accord. Mm -hmm. Right. God wasn't punishing me. I'm the one that left God. I'm the one that left the church. I'm the one that left the faith. God didn't leave me. I left him. Hello now. And when I found myself in a pretty miserable place, like the prodigal son, I eventually remembered, wait a minute, you know, when I was in church, when I was living for the Lord, when I was doing right and acting right, and following God's lead instead of trying to tell God where I wanted to go and how I wanted to get there, things went a whole lot better in my life. I need to go back to Daddy's house. Because I'll tell you what, even if I was a butler in daddy's house, I'd live better than I am out here. So he went home, and his dad said, no, 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 no son of mine's going to serve as a butler. Hallelujah. You left a son, you came home a son. Hallelujah. I got news for you, LGBT believer. Wherever you are in your life today, no matter how miserable a mess you've made, no matter how far away from dad you are, if you'll come home, all is well. Amen. Hallelujah. All is forgiven. God won't hold a grudge. But don't expect 
If you're going to be in church today, and a lot of LGBT believers are in church, and they're still wanting to do things their own way. They still don't want to follow God's design. I'm telling you, I was talking a little while ago about how the how God designed that the preacher was to be supported by they, those that they minister to. The number one reason LGBT churches fail is because they cannot get support. That's the number one reason. They cannot get people to support what they're doing. I'm not talking to us right now. I'm talking online to a whole bunch of folks who go to other LGBT affirming churches and they don't tithe. They don't support the church. They don't do a thing in the world. They think they can do things their own way instead of doing things God's way. And the end result of that, they're going to be able to handle. No, you can't handle it. You don't do things God's way, it turns to calamity. That church will close, and then guess what? You won't have a church. Then guess what? You're not going to be able to go anywhere and worship and be comfortable. You won't be able to go anywhere and worship and be honest. You won't be able to go anywhere and worship and be open about yourself and your relationships and what's going on in your life. Once again, you're going to find yourself having to hide in a closet just to go to church and worship God. How many in this room appreciate the fact you can go to church and you don't have to hide in a closet to be able to come to church and worship the Lord? Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I'm going to tell you, I know, I, I hate having, to, when I go to visit churches, you know, mainstream churches, I hate having to climb back in that closet. Just, all I want to do is worship the Lord. All I want to do is be able to shout and have church and worship God. But you know what? For me to do that, I've got to crawl right back in that box. And it's awful hard to worship God, no matter how big the sanctuary. It's awful hard to worship God when you're alone in the confessional. In this little tiny box. Am I telling the truth? It's awful hard to worship the Lord when you're trying to hide all these things. Trying to keep all these things. And, and you're not trying to hide them because you're ashamed of them. You're not trying to hide them because you think they're wrong or bad. You're trying to hide them because if you don't, all the donkeys around you are going to turn on you and cannibalize you. I'm here to tell you today, folks. Take nothing for granted. You can't handle it. Don't take God for granted. Don't take the way that God has ordained things to be done for granted. Don't take for granted that God's mercy is so big that He'll forgive you anything. That's, that's one of the biggest lines that cracks me up. People think, Martin, they can keep doing whatever they want to do because after all, God's mercy is so big. Even though the Apostle Paul said, what, shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? God forbid! Why? Because if you take the grace of God for granted, you lose. You lose. That grace is withdrawn. God said, no, I extend grace to those who need it. I am willing to overlook. I am willing to give unmerited, unearned, undeserved uh, mercy and credit to anybody who genuinely needs it. But when you purposely are trying to bank on my grace, oh, no, 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 that's a whole different ball of wax. Hello now. That's a whole that's not based on need. You're creating the need in that event. You're creating the need. No, 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 no. No. It doesn't work that way. Uzzah reached out and touched that ark in direct contradiction to everything God instructed Moses. No, the ark is not to be borne upon a cart. The ox is not to be touched by anyone including the priesthood, the Levites. It is only to be borne by the priests by reason of the poles on either side of him. Now that's four men. Boy, I'm going to tell you, unless the poles were longer and they, they were able to have more men, I don't know. Not Mormons, more men. 
Because seriously, we don't know. It very possible that you know that it was long enough where a couple more than just four could carry. All I know is when you got a wood box, and the term ark in the Old Testament, the same word is translated coffin. It is translated box. Uh, it, basically, it just simply means a container. That's all that the word ark means is container. But it's called the ark of God, the container of God, or the ark of the covenant, the container of the covenant. Inside the ark were placed three items. Aaron's rod, if you remember, when they went before Pharaoh, he had a rod that would blossom right in his hand. A flower would grow and it would appear right in his hand. Even though, of course, you know, you carry a, a staff of wood around, it doesn't usually grow flowers, right? But that was the miracle, that, that was God's miracle trying to reveal to Pharaoh and reveal to uh, the people of Israel who were bound in Egypt. That was trying to reveal to them his power. Aaron's rod that bloomed was there. There was a bowl of what I call porridge, which is what uh, Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for. You remember the story of Jacob and Esau? And Esau's the he was the older brother. He was the older twin. He's the one that had the birthright. He was to inherit everything his father had when he died. But Esau was so hungry one day when he came in that Jacob said, well, I'll feed you. All you got to do is give me your birthright. And his brother was fool enough to say, okay. I'll do it. And to this day, that's why we hear that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You don't hear Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But that's what it should have been. How do you like that? Esau gave away an awful lot, all for the sake of some food. His stomach was more important than his birthright. Talk about taking something for granted. Am I telling the truth today? You can't handle it, folks. I keep telling you, you can't handle it. You think you're going to take it for granted and you'll be able to live with the repercussions? You can't handle it. And then the last item in that ark was the stone tablets that God himself, with his own finger, had carved the Ten Commandments into. Those tablets are real. They're, that's not a fictional mm -hmm. story. They're real. Mm -hmm. And they're inside that ark. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called the Ark of the Covenant. It contains those things and it represents God's sitting place. It represents the meeting place with the Almighty. And yet Uzzah thought he could take it for granted and he lost his life. Oh, Uzzah, you can't. You can't handle it, son. You can't do things different than the way God ordained for it to be done and expect that you can handle the repercussions. And then, David, you've got all the nerve in the world to get mad at God. Well, I can't bring this thing into the city of David now! Look what happened! So he goes to Obedinam and says, Obedinam, I'm going to leave this at your house. you got a spot in your barn somewhere. you got a spot over somewhere. I can leave this thing. I'm not bringing this into the city of David. Look what happened to Uzzah. Obedinam said, well, sure enough. And he gave David a spot to put it. And he left it there a few months. And what happened? Somebody comes to David and said, man, you won't believe all the good things happening at Uzzah's house. You, uh, you know, not at Uzzah's house, at Obedinam's house. You know why? Because the ark was there. No. Because the ark was reverenced there. Because the ark was not taken for granted there. Obedidim had reverence for the ark. Obedidim appreciated the ark. Obedidim was like, hey, you want to leave God's sitting place? You want to leave the throne of God in my house? By all means. By all means, bring it on. You remember what happened to the Philistines when they stole the ark? They wound up with plagues coming up. Well, how come, how come Obedidim didn't wind up with plagues? Because he had the reverence, he had the respect, he was grateful for the presence of the ark. And that brought the blessing of God. Folks, in closing today, you want God to bless your life? You want the Lord to bring good things into your life? The, it's a very easy formula. 
do things God's way. It's that easy. I don't care if you're a straight, gay, cross-eyed, or blind. You've got to do things God's way. You do it God's way, and you will find blessing coming into your life. If there is anything I can honestly say in the almost 17 years, I can't believe it's been that long, that I've been ministering in Dallas, Texas, I have watched the Lord bring people into this church. Tommy can testify he's been there the whole journey. And we have watched the Lord bring people into this church over and over again. And as they get settled in and as they start doing things God's way, Johnny, all of a sudden you just see avenues of blessing opening up in their lives. You see good things starting to happen. We've had people come in. Joshua came in. He'd be with us today except he's living in Oklahoma and he had a stroke a while back and he's been uh, slowly recovering from the, he had a terrible time with that stroke Lisa, a very terrible time and he's not but a young man and uh, but Joshua will tell you he came to our church when he first came the poor kid was scraping pennies together trying to eat one of the first things he did when he started coming to our church I thought it was so sweet he brought one day a whole bunch of change and dumped it in the treasury and he said, I hope you don't mind that change. He said, I said, hey, every little bit helps, you know, it doesn't matter. He said, well, you know how when you spend a dollar, you get change, you know, you throw the, so I put the change aside in a little jar, whatever it is. He said, and, and I decided, you know, I'm not working, I don't have a job, I can't tie it. He said, but I decided, well, I'm going to give that change. You know what happened? <laughs> Very shortly thereafter, a job opened up for him. Then a car opened up for him. And then a, an apartment opened up for him. I'm not kidding, folks. Remember that movie? I mean, blessing just started coming to that kid as fast as he could open his arms to receive it. We had a woman start coming to our church who had come down here from uh, uh, Tennessee. Church of God background. She started coming to church. She started doing things God's way. All of a sudden, the job opened up for her. All of a sudden, things started happening. We have seen that happen, haven't we, Booby? Over and over and over again. But you know why? Because this pastor don't get up in the pulpit and tell you you can play games with God and you can do things any old way you want to do it and the Lord's going to bless you anyhow. No, no, no. I tell you the truth. If you want God to bless you, if you want the Lord to help you, if you want to be uh, under the spout where the glory comes out, all you got to do is let God lead. Do it God's way, and I guarantee, I, as sure as I'm alive, if I'm lying, you can walk out the door of the church and never come back. Don't bother me no way, but I've got news for you. God ain't never one time failed to prove me right. I know it from my own personal experience. When I first started coming back to church back in 98, uh, out, it, was it 98? Yeah. Started affirming ministry. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not going to lie to you. I've told you before. I, I try to be as transparent as I can because I can only help you if I'm willing to be honest and truthful. Johnny, I still did a lot of things I shouldn't have been doing for a while. I knew I needed to change those things, Lisa. Mm -hmm. I knew I needed to change some things. But you know what? When you give yourself permission to do some ugly things, uh, it's kind of hard to get out of the habit of doing them. But I made up in my mind, and I kept praying. I did. I kept praying. I said, Lord, I'm, I'm still kind of addicted to certain things. I'm still kind of, you know, stuck on doing things. Doing. Can you help me, God? Help me, Lord. Help me to overcome. And you know what? He did. And I did. And the way I'm living now ain't the way I was living even 20 years ago. I was in church, but I wasn't letting God lead. I was in church, but I wasn't doing everything the way God wanted it to be done. But I'll tell you what, when I got my horse in front of the cart, if you'll pardon the, <laughs> the illustration, when I got things in the right order, God began to bless, and things started happening. And where I'm at today in my life is a whole lot better a place than I've ever been before. And the only thing different today, Johnny, is I've learned to let God lead. 
because every time I decided I was going to do it my way, in spite of God's instruction, I came to realize that uh, um, I can't handle it. I can't handle it. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen.